The section that Mike just read for us there out of Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 1 through 4, is an interesting section of Scripture. Maybe I think back to whenever I was in elementary school or junior high, and I would have a coat that I'd carry with me to school, and at times I might forget it. And then I go looking for it, and I can't find it, and so I have to go to the lost and found, or maybe somebody was kind enough to turn it in to the teacher. Maybe they recognized it and brought it back to me. But Deuteronomy 22, 1 through 4 is the law of Moses, and it gives a special requirement that if you happen to notice somebody's animal who's gone missing, and you know who that animal belongs to, carry the animal back. Maybe you don't know who the owner of the animal is, and so what you have to do at that point is take the animal in for yourself and take care of that animal until its rightful owner comes and finds it. When something was lost, there was a responsibility to find it and to restore it. Whether it was the animal, whether it was somebody's coat, you couldn't neglect your responsibility. You couldn't see this animal just wandering by itself in the ditch grazing and turn a blind eye to it. You could not see somebody's garment laying on the side of the road and just kind of walk around it. But the law of Moses said you have a responsibility that when something is lost, when an animal is wandering, you do what you can to return it. Now, we don't live under the law of Moses today, but there's a great principle that applies in that. A great principle that can apply to many things that we could discuss in this life. But if we see the importance of returning that animal, of returning that garment, how much greater of a responsibility do we have when we see a soul that is wandering to return it back to its rightful owner? If we look in James chapter 5, the final two verses of this wonderful book, James gives us instruction by the Holy Spirit about the responsibility that we have. That when we recognize a brother or a sister who is wandering, one who has gotten lost like that animal back in Deuteronomy chapter 22, we have a responsibility to do what we can to return back to its owner, to help restore that soul that is erring. James chapter 5 verses 19 and 20 say, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We must recognize the great responsibility that we have as brethren to do what we can to restore those who are erring. And that means we're going to have to watch for wandering. The very first portion of James chapter 5 and verse 19 says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. There is a fact that we cannot escape from the beginning of this verse, that it is possible to wander from the truth. James says, if anyone among you wanders. The idea behind this is to recognize that a time is going to come when somebody is going to wander away from the truth. We're not talking about those who have never been with the truth, who have never known or obeyed it, but rather we are talking about those who have known the truth, obeyed the truth, but at some point in time have wandered away from that truth. It means that we're going to have to watch out. Because Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 tells us we must give the more earnest things to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. It's possible to wander. It's possible to drift if we are not careful. If we are not watching, we're going to have to watch out for each other. We're going to have to keep an eye out for our family. James here in chapter 5 and verse 19 says, Brethren, if anyone among you... We're talking about those who know the truth. We're talking about brethren. Every single chapter in the book of James, we find this term brethren used multiple times. Everything that James has dealt with in the book is, is specific to those who are already Christians, those who are brethren, those who are a part of the family, of the house of God, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. 
We must recognize each other as family members, as brothers, as sisters, if we're going to have the type of relationship that we need, if we're going to be able to watch out for one another as we ought to, to keep a close eye on each other as family. We need to be intentional in our relationships. Well, we could go back to Acts chapter 2 towards the end of that chapter. But we could look at the end of Acts chapter 4 and see the way that the early disciples, the early church, treated each other in the family. How they cared for one another and they would make sacrifices for the good of their brethren. We can think about Paul and the way that he would look at those who were his brethren. We could go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2. Titus chapter 1 and verse 4, and notice how Paul would refer to Timothy, he would refer to Titus as a, a true son in the faith. That for the time that he invested in these individuals to teach them the gospel, he looked at them as if they were his own son. He loved them. He was intentional. Even as Paul would instruct Philemon in the book of Philemon, Philemon, who had had this, this individual, this slave in his home named Onesimus. And Onesimus had wandered away from Philemon's house. And he comes in contact with the Apostle Paul. Paul teaches Onesimus the gospel and, and instructs Onesimus that to do the right thing, true repentance says, you're going to have to go back home. You've got to go back to Philemon. But Paul writes ahead. And Paul sends the letter to Philemon in verses 15 and 16. Paul is encouraging Philemon to be intentional in his relationship with Onesimus. Yes, I know that he has wronged you. Yes, I know that he left you in a bind when he wandered away. But Philemon, he's coming back as a brother. And you need to see him as more than a brother. How intentional are we in our relationships with each other? Are we merely just associates, or are we truly friends? Are we truly family? Because as a family, we need to be looking out for each other, because we know that it is possible to wander away from the truth. We need to help each other keep a close eye on the path. It's not an easy thing to do. Oh, it's easy to say we're going to follow the truth, but... It's a challenge to actually put that into practice. Do we love the truth to follow it enough for ourselves? Do we love it enough to help those around us follow in it? We have to recognize that there is a clear path for us to follow. Yes, at times there is room for opinion and matter of judgment, but at the end of the day, we must recognize in God's Word, we have truth. The truth, John 8, 32, that can set us free. The truth, John chapter 17 and verse 17, that is God's Word. And it's by that truth that God can make us holy. Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. And if we realize it, we have to do something about it. You remember back in James chapter 1? James chapter 1 verse 22 when Paul or excuse me when James says there do not be hearers of the word but doers not hearing only deceiving yourselves James says we must be doers of the word doers of the truth that we must recognize the path and continue in it because it's easy to wander it's easy to stray I don't know how many of you like to go hiking, and, and there's various levels of hiking. Some of us like to go hiking when it's a nice, a smooth, and a, a wide, easy, clear path. And then there are those who like to go hiking when uh, there's really not room to put two feet next to each other, and it's just a small little trail, and you've got to keep your eye on that trail because you might quickly wander off in either direction and get lost. When you think about Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. 
Brethren, if we wish to be among the few who find the way to life, we need each other. We need to count on our relationship with each other, to trust each other, to know that if I take my eye off the path and I start to wander away from the trail that a brother or sister is going to come and and bring me back to the right path, to help point out to me that I've wandered, that I've strayed. We keep an eye out for each other. We keep an eye out for our family because we know the danger of straying. Oh, if we do not know God and we do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, if we don't continue in that faithful obedience, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 tell us that we will be punished with everlasting destruction from the glory of the Lord and the presence of His power. Oh, I know the dangers of straying away and, and just how disgusting it is. Peter would write in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 20, about those who had known the truth, those who had obeyed the gospel of Christ Jesus, but over the course of time had wandered away from that truth. And Peter says in that wandering, the picture is like a, a dog who has gone back to eat its own vomit. It's like that pig who has been washed and been cleaned just to go back and wallow around in the mire. If I can look at straying from the truth in that way, if I see a return to sin in that disgusting light, and I know what it means for eternity, I'm going to make sure for myself I stay on the path. But I'm going to do what I can to bring my brethren back to the path. If a child were to go missing, if one of our own children here in the congregation were to go missing, what would we be doing? Oh, we'd be up here at the building and we'd have a search party ready. The sheriff's office would be here and we'd be putting pictures out on Facebook. Have you seen this child? Have you seen this child? And we would be doing everything we can within our power to find that child and bring them back to where we know that they'll be safe. But what do we do when a brother or sister goes missing? No, not physically, but spiritually. Do we work just as hard to bring them back? You see, if we love them as we ought to, if we're intentional in our relationships as we ought to be, then we will do everything we can within our power to look out for each other, And as soon as a brother or sister starts to stray, to bring them back to the best of our ability, to bring them back to the truth, to help restore them to where they need to be. Wandering is easy if we're not careful, if we're not focused, if we're not doing everything we can, not just for ourselves, but also for one another. And when we see a brother or sister who has gone astray, who has wandered away from that path of truth that we find in God's Word, we need to do what we can to redirect them, to turn them around and and bring them back to the truth. You keep looking in James chapter 5, and after it is, James says in verse 19, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, he continues to say, And someone turns him back. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. How many people do we know? How many brethren do we know that used to sit next to us in the pew and are no longer here? Not because of death or not because of moving away but instead because the brother or sister wandered away from the truth. What have we done as his family to bring them back? Because James here is not saying that it's the responsibility of the elders or the preacher or the deacons, but rather it's the responsibility of every single one of us to do what we can to bring those who have strayed back. If anyone wanders from the truth, it doesn't matter who it is, but if any of our brethren wander, and someone, not just the elders, not just the preacher, not just the deacons, 
not just the Bible class teachers, and we could go on and on, but if someone brings them back. You see, there's a responsibility there. There's a responsibility there that we actively go to them that we actively do what we can to try and redirect them and bring them back to the truth. You might think about Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12 that we often refer to as the golden rule. Therefore, as you would have men to do, do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And we'll apply that to to many aspects of life, that if we want others to be kind to us, well, we need to be kind to them. Right? We teach our children, if you want others to share with you, you need to share with them. But have we ever thought about it in the aspect of our spiritual lives? How we interact with our brethren? That if it were us, if it were me that wanders from the truth, would I not want someone to bring me back? to help make sure that I understand what I'm doing, that if I continue the path I'm going, if I continue wandering, that where it's going to lead for eternity. Would I not want a brother or sister to bring me back? As I would have others do to me, I need to do to them. Which means I need to be active in helping to restore those who have strayed. Oh, we think about uh, at times how it is that that we use our GPS to get us somewhere. And I generally have to have my GPS talking to me to tell me what to do, but sometimes that function gets turned off. And so I have to count on Autumn to help me make sure I I see, okay, there's an exit coming up. This is your turn. But if we're not paying attention, you go right past it. And the GPS has to reroute you. It has to redirect you. But if you're not paying attention to it or you don't hear it, it's going to keep saying rerouting, 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 rerouting. Sometimes we turn that noise off in our head. And spiritually speaking, we wander. And we don't hear the truth saying, come back, come back, come back. And we need each other. We need someone from the family to come and to hug us, to put a hand on our shoulder, to let us know that they love us, to point out to us how far we've wandered from the truth, but to make sure we know that we can always come back, that we can always turn back to the truth. But in order to be the one that goes and does that, I have to take a hard look at myself. I have to make sure before I go and speak to a brother or sister about the error that they may be in, that I look to make sure that I'm not going to talk to them who may just have a speck in their eye when I have a a log coming out of my own, Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. I have to make sure that I consider myself lest I also be tempted, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. But I have to go to them. I can't be passive about the situation. I must actively go to the brother or the sister who is strayed. But when it happens, what do I do? When I notice a brother or a sister who may be wandering from the truth, there are several ways I could handle it. I could recognize them starting to drift, and and they may not have left services completely, but I can recognize something's wrong, and, and I can just ignore it. Oh, maybe I can see this beginning to happen and I I realize they're starting to be here less and less and they're they're not active and they're not engaged anymore and, and I can just wash my hands of them and say good riddance. Oh, maybe I recognize it and I go to them, but I'm harsh in the way that I do so. That I don't approach them in love, but instead I approach them in a way that says, how could you? You know better than this. What are you doing? Or instead, I can go to them in love. Put a hand on their shoulder. Be there for them. Let them know that we love them, that we miss them, that things aren't right whenever they're not here. But at the same time, to make sure they understand that if things don't change, they're not going to find the way back to the truth. 
that we have to be loving. We have to make sure that we show that we care. We must give them that choice of love because through the love that we show, James says we can help save the erring. Maybe this is an aspect that we don't always think about as James goes on in the first part of verse 20 to say, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death. There's nothing that we do in and of ourselves to save ourselves or to save somebody else. It's only by the grace of God, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that any of us can be saved. Yet, The Holy Spirit is telling us through James that when we do what we can to restore those who have wandered, those who are erring, that we have a hand in helping save a soul from death. Because what if we had never gone to them? What if we had ignored it? What if we had washed our hands of them and let the brother or sister wander? Then do you realize what's on our hands? James 1 and verse 15 says, When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. If we never go to the brother or sister and do what we can to help restore them, to help them see the the nature of the way that they're going and help them turn and repent of that sin and come back to the truth, then that soul is going to continue wandering on until death. But if we go to them, if we're able to help restore them, James says we're saving a soul from death. It's much like what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, as Paul is, is writing this letter to Timothy, a, a young preacher who is going through uh, different situations and dealing with false teachers and trying to understand what it is that needs to be done. Paul would tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. That as we continue in the truth, we know that we can be saved by the grace of God. And that as we bring others back to the truth, and as we find those who are outside that have never known the truth, and we bring them in by the truth, We can all be saved. What are we doing in love to help save those who are erring? To help bring our brethren away from the darkness, away from the the path they are headed, to bring them back to the truth? What are we doing to lovingly encourage repentance? As James continues there in James chapter 5 and verse 20, after he says that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his away will save a soul from death. The very last part of this verse says, and cover a multitude of sins. What James is getting at here is the importance of repentance. That a brother or sister cannot continue in sin and and expect for grace to abound. That's Romans chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. And so to help turn the brother back, to turn that sister back to the truth, to redirect them back to what is right. It means that repentance is going to take place. Jesus himself would say in Luke 13 and verse 3, that except we repent, we will all likewise perish. We can't expect to find salvation if we're continuing in sin. And so we help the brother or sister see where they are and and help encourage them in a loving way to do the right thing, to take care of the sin, to come back home. And when that repentance takes place, oh, there's great joy. We're happy, yes, because the brother or sister has come home. And we come and we hug them and we welcome them back, but we also recognize the joy that takes place in heaven when one repents. We see as well the joy that's going to be there in the one who has repented. Psalm 32 is a wonderful psalm that deals with with the beauty of forgiveness. And the very first verse of that psalm says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sins are covered. When we repent of sin, when somebody else repents of sin, what it is is, is as if God is completely covering that sin. 
Oh, he's putting the dirt over top of it, never to dig it back up again. What a wonderful thing to know that that sin can be covered. And brethren, when we do our part to go and to lovingly help restore those who have wandered, we're helping to put the dirt on top of their sin, helping them to do what must be done in order to repent. James is pointing back to Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12, that that hatred stirs up strife, but love covers a multitude of sins. And really, the way that James is using it is much like the way that Peter does. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, Peter says there that, that above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. It's not that love overlooks sin. It's not that love ignores sin. But instead, when love recognizes it, love does what it can to correct it. Love does what it can to go to that brother to go to that sister who is erring and to try to help restore them. And we see the importance back in Deuteronomy 22 of, of the animal that has wandered or, or of the coat that has gotten lost. But do we see the importance when a brother or sister strays? What are we doing to help restore those of our number here who are no longer with us? Have we ignored it? Or do we reach out to them in love? Do we do what we can to help these individuals realize they've wandered away from the path of truth and that we want them to come back, that God wants them to come back? Perhaps you've wandered from the truth today. Maybe it's not the case that you have completely left being here altogether, but Perhaps in your mind you've started to wander. You've started to stray and you realize that you've gone away from that path of truth by the way you've been living your life during the week and and you realize you cannot continue in that. Know that you're surrounded by your brothers and sisters and that we want to help you. We want to encourage you. We want to love you. But sometimes you've got to let us know. Look back up at James 5 and verse 16. Maybe you're just struggling and you need prayers for strength and for encouragement. We can help you with that. Don't let it bring you down to the point that you wander away, but instead, use it as an opportunity to grow, to find strength, and let us help you. If you're ready to obey the gospel for the very first time, the water's ready. And if you're ready to repent of your sins, to confess the name of Christ Jesus, and to put Him on in baptism, We can help you with it so that you can begin your walk in truth and so that God can add you to His family. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. And if you have any need, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?